Oh, Ed, it's such a treat to be having dinner out for a change. What do you mean, having dinner? We haven't even ordered yet. Don't be so optimistic, Wanda. Now, Ed, calm down. We've only been here for 45 minutes, and you have to expect Oh, some... boy, I almost caught her eye that time. Sit down, Ed. What'll people think? And stop waving that napkin. Well, I'm hungry. Hey, waitress! Ed, Ed, I'm not going to stay here and be mortified. I'm don't get up, don't get up. She's coming at last. Yes, sir. Are you having dinner? Well, that seems to be a rather moot point. Now, Ed, stop being funny and give her our order. Bring us two chopsteaks, raw. Raw? Don't you mean rare? I mean raw. If we waited for them to cook them, we'd be sitting here next week. And if you don't hurry up with that order, miss, I'll take a bite out of the next person who passes this table. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. There isn't any more chopsteaks. Oh. Let's hope our friend was well enough acquainted with market conditions to be prepared for that contingency. You may think that you are well acquainted with the ups and downs of marketing these days, but are you aware of the existence of parasitic dangers in the black market? Our science reporter is, and he's here for the purpose of explaining those dangers to us. Ladies and gentlemen, Emerson Markham. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? We'd better mention right here that we're indebted to Miss Lucy W. Clausen of the Department of Public Education at the American Museum of Natural History for the facts in the case. The case of the people versus the black market, I take it. That's right, Bob. Miss Clausen pointed out that in these days of the black market, meat and disease go together. How's that, Emerson? Unfortunately, the great majority of the public is completely ignorant of the fact that unsanitary meat can be the cause of tuberculosis, trichinosis, toxic food poisoning, tapeworm, just to mention a few, and that black market meat is unsanitary. Yes, I suppose the black marketers aren't too careful in slaughtering the meat. But that's one of the reasons. The black market is run by people who, for the sake of large profits, will not hesitate to slaughter animals under unsanitary conditions. They neither know where, nor do they know or care if such animals are diseased. The meat is not properly refrigerated after slaughter, and transportation often takes place in unclean vehicles. Naturally, black market meat is not government inspected and is sold through unlicensed sources, so that if you purchase such meat knowingly, you become an accessory in a criminal action. How about the parasitic dangers you mentioned? What sort of dangers are they? Well, first of all, let's review some facts about the parasites themselves. Since the existence of a parasite depends upon its transference from host to host, its life history has been modified to meet the changing conditions of environment. The ideal parasitic existence depends upon several factors. The presence of an available host, the ability of getting into that host, and the adaptability of the parasite to live in the host without endangering the life of the host. Uh, would you mind enlarging a little on that? Uh, the ability of the parasite to live in the host without endangering its life? When a parasite has the ability to infect more than one host, it seems logical that it is thereby increasing its chance of survival. Because the parasite lives at the expense of its host, its ultimate goal is therefore to adapt its existence in such a way that it will not shorten the life of its host and lose its meal tickets. So it tends to build up a gradually increasing immunity against the parasite. And I suppose science has stepped in here to help fight against these parasites. Right, Bob. You see, parasites have developed more or less complicated life cycles and as a rule show definite affinity, naturally, for only one or at most a few species of animals. Therefore, one of the first steps in fighting any disease is to determine the mode of transmission and then, once the chain has been established, to seek out some weak link which may be broken. Well, how do they travel, Emerson? A great discovery of science is that many disease organisms travel in or on something alive, something that walks, that flies, that hops, that crawls, that swims, or that has some means of locomotion. Without such assistance, these disease organisms are helpless. One by one, the strange life histories of these parasites have been unraveled, Tales of adventurous wanderings more incredible than those of Sinbad. Well, uh, tell us, Emerson, what are some of the parasites we're in danger of running into in black market meat? One of the most dangerous parasitic infections made increasingly possible by black market meat operations is trichinosis, which comes mainly from garbage-fed pigs or from pigs bred in unsanitary rat-infested piggeries. Is there much trichinosis in the United States? Yes, the occurrence of this disease is surprisingly high in the United States. There are seasonal fluctuations reaching a peak during the winter months when consumption of pork products is greatest. Statistics show it to be most prevalent in the North Atlantic states. The pork tapeworm, however, is rare among the Jews and Mohammedans who avoid the meat of the hog, and it is very common in parts of Europe where pork is eaten without cooking. Well, just how do you get trichinosis? It's a disease caused by a very tiny worm. 
When the meat from a pig infected with this worm is eaten, man will most likely become infected with the disease unless the meat is thoroughly cooked. If the meat is not thoroughly cooked, the larvae, the young tapeworms, go down the man's digestive tract, and then the worms begin to reproduce in the lower part of his small intestine. There are male and female worms, and a single female worm is capable of being a mother to as many as 1,500 worms. Pity the poor fellow was playing mine host to them. Yes. But what happens next is that the male and the female worm, having achieved their mission in life, proceed to die, leaving the 1,500 offspring to go through their definite life cycle in order to reach maturity. These 1,500 youngsters lose no time in taking their first step toward that end, which is to enter the bloodstream. Once in the bloodstream, they are assured of transportation to all parts of the body and immediately proceed to penetrate the tissues and to perforate the muscles. What happens then? Well, this is the end for them because the infected human flesh would have to be eaten by another animal in order for the larvae to reach maturity. This may be the end for the infected man, too, because in many cases, trichinosis is fatal. That tail would certainly make the black market lose any appeal it might have had. Well, what other things should we be on the lookout for? One other parasite dangerous to health is the beef tapeworm, which, believe it or not, can be contracted from the choicest cuts of beef, porterhouse steak, sirloin steak, standing rib roast, and so on. Government inspection in Western countries and in the United States greatly reduced the occurrence of this once common parasite. Well, that's good. Yes, but in parts of Africa where sanitation is poor, and in Tibet, where beef is prepared by broiling large pieces over an open fire, a large proportion of the population is infected. Among the Hindus of India, who consider the cow sacred and have religious restrictions against eating beef, to be caught with a beef tapeworm would undoubtedly prove embarrassing. I can see how it might. Emerson, uh, does the beef tapeworm go through the same stages as the pork worm? No, the life cycle of the beef tapeworm parasite is a little different. The beef tapeworm eggs are picked up in the first place by the cow while grazing in some infected part of the pasture. They are thus taken into the cow's digestive tract, where the action of the digestive juices dissolve the outer covering of the eggs, freeing the tiny worms. Once freed, these newly hatched worms make their way into the muscles of the cow, where they form small cyst-like masses. Then man eats the meat and becomes infected too? Yes. When the flesh of the infected cow is eaten by man, these cyst-like masses hatch out in man's digestive tract. The beef tapeworm, composed of numerous segments, is so completely adapted to a parasitic way of living that it has no digestive system of its own. It absorbs food through its own body walls. I can see where we ought to be sure our meat is well cooked. Indeed we should. And I'd admonish those who like their steak rare to develop a taste for well-cooked meat uh, while sources of supply are so uncertain because certain disease diseases contracted from infected meats may not become evident for several weeks. It is also possible for a person to become infected with more than one of these parasites at the same time. Aside from the danger of personal infection, patronizing the black market in time of war not only lowers morale by the knowledge that you were breaking the law and helping others to do so, but it is also an unpatriotic act to say nothing of the danger you invite where the health of your loved ones is concerned. Incidentally, Emerson, how do you get rid of these parasites? The only way to get rid of them is to take by mouth some drug which kills the head and causes it to detach itself from the intestinal wall, whereupon the whole worm is evacuated with the waste material. Living at the expense of one's neighbor is an old habit among animals. Practically all animals harbor one or more kinds of parasites, and most of these are themselves hosts to still smaller parasites. There is a tendency among most people to look upon parasitism as an abnormal way of life and upon parasites as being something uh, immoral or at least, at least less respectable. But since there are more parasites than free-living individuals, a parasitic existence may be considered a normal way of life. Who can say that the parasite, the very existence of which depends upon doing as little harm as possible to its host, is a less considerate creature than the voracious carnivore which kills its victims outright? I, for one, won't undertake an answer, Emerson. But, ladies and gentlemen, the best way to obtain answers for any questions you may have about this black market menace would be to send for a copy of a paper by Miss Lucy W. Clausen of the Department of Public Education at the American Museum of Natural History, which contains the story we brought you here and other facts besides. All you have to do to get your copy is just direct your requests to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are now listening, asking for scientific paper number 149, Parasitic Dangers in the Black Market. That's... Parasitic Dangers in the Black Market. 
scientific paper number 149. And now we've arrived at the time when you listeners receive answers to the scientific inquiries you've sent in to us. The answers your questions will receive, you know, are as accurate and up-to-date as can be obtained since they are based on information provided by staff members of the General Electric Research Laboratory or by other equally trustworthy sources. The best way to show you the kind of answers you'll receive, though, is to start asking some of your questions. So let's start with this one, Emerson. It comes from a lady in Worcester, Massachusetts, who would like us to explain how electricity governs the moving of the Ouija index on a Ouija board. First of all, what's a Ouija board? <laughs> well, a Ouija board is a board on which the alphabet and various signs are written. It's used with a planchette to obtain, uh, well, shall we say, mediumistic messages? Well, we might say so if we knew <laughs> what a planchette is. <laughs> well, that's a small, usually heart-shaped board, which is supported on coasters at two points and on a vertical pencil at a third point. It has been said that when the fingers of one or more persons are lightly arrested on the board, it sometimes moves without conscious volition or effort of the operator, so that the pencil point traces words or letters. Our uh, listener wants to know if there's any scientific basis for the answers that an Ouija board gives. What do you think about that, Emerson? Well, we doubt if any scientific study of the board has ever been made, Bob. If our friend is interested in the subject, she might write to the American Society for Psychical Research, 40 East 34th Street, New York City. Scientific phenomena are investigated there by competent groups. We're not in a position to answer questions not within the realm of science, I'm afraid. One more question about this Ouija board, Emerson. The lady wants to know if it is governed by the nerves in the fingers, mental telepathy, or just what? Now, some people claim that the movements of the Ouija board and the messages received are due to the workings of the subconscious mind. But it's no doubt a physical rather than a psychological reaction. You mean, then, the direction and amount of movement of the fingers is due to something physical? Exactly. It's due to the position which the arms are in. They're held extended without any support for a length of time, which causes muscular uh, tremors, which in turn cause the resulting movements. Now, this next question has been the subject of a discussion, and our listener, a resident of Detroit Beach, Monroe, Michigan, would like us to settle a matter for her. It seems that one of her friends maintained that a mouse or rat is capable of flattening itself out to squeeze through very small openings and cracks. Our friend wonders whether this is possible. I asked Dr. Roger Conant, curator of the Philadelphia Zoological Garden, about that. He tells us that mice and rats have firmly constructed bony skulls. And the size of the openings through which they can squeeze themselves certainly would be no smaller than the size of their heads. The rest of their bodies is supple enough, however, so that they probably could manage to squeeze through any opening that the head passed through without difficulty. But Emerson, our questioner, tells us that her friend has actually observed the rodents' presence in places where it is seemingly impossible for them to enter. How do you explain that? Well, as Dr. Conant pointed out, the presence of rodents in places which seem difficult of access or in buildings which have been vermin-proofed is usually due to one of two factors. First, the animals were carried inside inadvertently in boxes or other containers. Or second, some vulnerable spot through which they can gain access has been overlooked. You see, their very sharp incisors can easily and quickly enlarge a very tiny hole. Well, I guess we'll have time for one more. What does it signify when, as a result of tapping on the knee, the foot kicks upward, asks our listener. Uh, that's the normal reaction, Bob, known as a reflex. And it's due to a sensory impulse which is transmitted to the spinal cord, plus a motor impulse which is transmitted back from the cord to the knee. This produces the immediate kick. Suppose there's no reaction to this tapping. Well, it simply means that the circuit is broken somewhere, which is evidence of disease. Well, friendly relations might be broken if we don't terminate our remarks. So I'll just say thank you, Emerson Markham, and goodbye, everyone, until our next excursion in science.